I want to support the um, motion in front of the House today and I just want to put on the record my agreement with everything that, that, that Deputy Carl Berry has said there and acknowledge his deep expertise in this area. Um, to my mind, the participation by Ireland in Europe is, is a natural extension of Ireland's integration in Europe, a natural extension of Ireland's um, deeper collaboration with European partners in a whole range of different fronts and I don't see that defence necessarily needs to be, to be, to be different. Defence is about our own strategic self-interest, our strategic self self-interest is at the heart of Europe and our strategic self-interest is about equipping ourselves in, in a serious way for the challenges that we know are ahead. As Deputy Barry has said, the, the opportunity from participating in the PESCO uh, programmes, in the, in the four additional programmes, is about enhancing our own expertise. It is about enhancing our own intelligence and our access to intelligence. It is about enhancing our own contribution to the security that I sometimes worry we take for granted or we, that we, we could take for granted. And it is about reducing risk to Ireland and to Irish people by having put the work in to better, deeper integration and developing better skills for our defence forces. It is a deeply professional defence forces. It needs, better, it needs better, better support financially. It needs better support from government. I'm very glad that the Minister has published the work on the Commission of the Defence Forces, and I strongly support the, the, the work of, of, of the Commission in identifying the key strategic challenges for defence and the investment that's needed. Um, and I might come back to that. But Ireland is a small, open country. It's the necessity for us to participate collaboratively with other partners is not unique to defence in any way. We do the same thing with, with medical development. We do the same thing with scientific development. Uh, we, we must continue to participate and learn from each, our, our colleagues and, and, get, and get the best that we possibly can. It is in our rational self-interest to do so. On the defence, additional defence spending, I strongly urge the Minister to take the opportunity to go as far as he possibly can in relation to this at this time. I am strongly of the view, and ever since, and this is, this is and I know the, the Commission report was published in advance of the, the invasion of Ukraine, but certainly what I'm hearing back from my constituents is that a deep concern that Ireland simply isn't equipped to deal with the challenges that can face it at any time. It wasn't capable of addressing the, sorry, the deputies. It wasn't capable of addressing the cyber attack or preventing the cyber attack that, that occurred, which was as disruptive, if not more disruptive, than the COVID challenges itself to, to the health system. It, you know, we are at risk of that at all time. And when you look at the complexities, the, the risks that are set out by the report and how they face Ireland, they're very real risks. The implication, the Brexit implications and the trade implications and the question of, of managing our territory in relation to that. The question of how Ireland is situated geographically and strategically around changes in geopolitical power dynamics, whether against Ireland, which I, I again stress is by no means impossible, uh, and against the EU more generally, and obviously Ireland is a participant of that. As I've already said, the challenges in relation to infrastructure and, and IT, which can be hit at any point, and Ireland is uniquely vulnerable to that being an island economy as we are. The challenge of European border instability and instability on, on the continent of Europe more broadly. The challenge of organised crime and terrorism. The challenges of energy security and raw material security and what that might look like. If anything, the war in Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine, has given us an opportunity, a, a window into the possible future of quite how at risk we always have been and how, quite how much at risk we remain. Um, the, the risk of... Um, the, the, the more demanding peacekeeping requirements that, 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 that we know that we're participating in and want to participate in. And I suppose my question is, if the government doesn't take the opportunity to participate in these PESCO projects, if the government doesn't take the opportunity to invest in our defence forces, as so many deputies have called for in terms of salaries, um, better, better resource investment, uh, if, the deputy, if, if the department, if the government doesn't take the opportunity to equip as well as possible our defence forces and to give every professional opportunity to every member of the defence forces to become the very best that's possible for our structure and something goes wrong, what deputies are prepared to go back to their constituencies and say that they weren't happy to do it? What deputies are then happy to go back and say, yeah, we weren't happy to give the additional funding to the defence forces that we knew were needed? We weren't happy to do that. Now is our opportunity to take, to take stock of what we've seen across Europe. Now is our opportunity to recognise that we were always at risk. Now is our opportunity to reflect on the fact that, you know, maybe we have collectively been a little naive in relation to our perceptions of our own security. We've been sh shown again and again, even just in the, la in the last 12 months, that we're not immune 
to international challenge, that we're not immune to geopolitical risk. We've seen the, the, the threat by Russian, R R Russian ships in our own maritime area. We are aware of quite how exposed our maritime area is, of quite how large it is relative to our European partners. We are aware of our own um, limitations, and it's been clearly pointed out to us by the, spending, the Commission on Defence Spending. Uh, or the Commission on, on the Defence Forces, which has huge spending, um, which is huge spending implications. And it is so easy to take those reports and put them on a shelf, and it's so easy to fail to act. It's so easy to just let um, a convenient narrative of we're safe, we've always been safe, and we've always been this way, and we always need to stay that way. And it's just not true, and it's not even accurate based on the evidence to date, never mind what, what risks we can foresee as reasonable in the future and the things that we can't foresee. And again, I go back and ask, if and when something happens and we've known about the risks and we didn't invest or we didn't take the steps to have better, deeper integration with our European partners, with professional defence forces around the continent who, from whom we can learn from whom we can, and to whom we can contribute our expertise, what will the Irish public say to us at that point? And are deputies ready to go back and have those conversations in an honest way? And I think they're reasonable questions. I was in, um, I had the opportunity on behalf of the Parliament to visit Finland recently. The Kian Korla appointed me to uh, the Women's Parliamentary Network, which meets in Helsinki twice a year. And I took the opportunity there to meet different members of Parliament just about their recent experience with joining NATO and how that had gone from a public opinion perspective um, and a political perspective and what they had experienced over the previous six months. And obviously Finland as a, as had been a neutral country for, for a very long time. Obviously, Finland had always experienced uh, in a way that, you know, as, as two, as two uh, European entities on either side of Northern Europe, we hadn't experienced or understood the risks that they had always understood. And obviously, Finland had made themselves more than NATO ready. And obviously, they had taken the steps that put them in, pla in, 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 pla put the, put in place the steps that were needed to make themselves NATO ready, if that's what they ever chose to do, making it a an option 20 years previously and making them practical changes like signal changes and so on. But what I think was really important was the public opinion experience in Finland over the time when they saw the, 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 the realisation of that risk, albeit in a different part of the continent, and how quickly that changed, and how quickly members of parliament signed up. I think they had 98 or 98, 9 percent of members of parliament voted for it. A couple of um, far left deputies, identified by them, not me, um, uh, voted against it, and a couple of abstained. But such was the public opinion shift in such a short period from having not wanting to be involved with NATO to absolutely getting involved in NATO. And again, entirely based on rational self-interest. We don't face the same direct threat that Finland faces, but we're similar in many other respects. And we have to have a conversation now about how far we're ready to both equip ourselves, act in our rational self-interest, and really give our defence forces the opportunity to be the best, most professional organisation that it can be, and certainly for a small island. Uh, and I think that, the, at a minimum, participation in these, in these schemes, in these projects, in these PESCO projects, is, is an absolute minimum. But I would call on the Minister to take the opportunity now that is there, and certainly that my constituents are calling for, for significantly enhanced funding for the defence forces across every stream. Thank you. Thank you.